Hi, this is Joe Holloway, and thank you for joining us for the Eastern Shore Veterans, Their Story, Their Honor. And today, our guest is Dave Wharton from Salisbury, Maryland. How you doing, Dave? Just fine. Just Good. fine. Good. Um, Dave, thanks for joining us. Um, I understand you were in the Air Force. That's correct. Um, before we start there, tell us about growing up in Salisbury. Um, actually, uh, I'm native of Salisbury. I was born and raised on... Uh, East Church Street, uh, about four or five houses down from East Salisbury School. Mm -hmm. Went to East Salisbury School, uh, went to what is now uh, Y Middle, at that time it was Y Junior High, and then went to Y Comico Senior High, which is Y High now, and uh, graduated from uh, Y High in 1963. Uh, was an avid hunter and sportsman. Uh, Somewhat of a loner. I didn't play in group sports, so I didn't play football or baseball. Mm -hmm. uh, did a lot of hunting, mm -hmm. a lot of fishing, typical of the Eastern Shore. Right. And uh, from there, uh, enrolled in uh, Towson University and uh, spent about three years there. Uh, huh. Ran up against some difficulties with my history courses and uh, actually flunked out in the third year. And, uh, of course, uh, during that time, Vietnam was very hot, so uh, I immediately went from 4F to 1A and uh, got a letter from Uncle Sam real quick during the summer. Mm -hmm. And I had a choice. I, I could either be drafted into the military or I could uh, mm -hmm. enlist. Right. So I weighed out the different branches and looked at the different branches, and I figured, hey, uh, the path of least resistance probably would be to join the Air Force. Uh, I didn't want to be on the ground fighting in Vietnam, so Army and Marine Corps was probably out, and I didn't like the Navy, so Air Force it was. And so they didn't teach you to swim at, at um, East Salisbury School, huh? No, you thought, no you, you thought, not hardly. <laughs> they didn't teach you to fly either, right? No, they didn't. <laughs> um, so in that period, you know, growing up, you know, Church Street, getting out of high school. A lot of your friends end up joining the service about that time? Yeah, People there were. Know. There was a lot of them that, that uh, joined right out of high school. Mm -hmm. And uh, then, of course, there was those that, that actually got the draft, too. Right, right. So, yeah, I had a lot of friends that, yeah. that went into service. So you decided you'd, you'd um, buy for the Air Force? Uh, and and doing time. that, uh, instead of getting two years in the Army, you signed up in the Air Force for four years. Mm -hmm. uh, so I signed up for the Air Force, uh, uh, went and took my physicals uh, over in Baltimore, and from there I was off to Lackland Air Base. Mm -hmm. So you would go through a basic training, basically, like you know the Army, yeah. the Marines. Oh yeah, you know, same the thing. And uh, uh, went through uh, the basic training. Uh, normally, coming out of basic training, you would uh, get 30 days leave and then go to tech school. Mm -hmm. uh, unfortunately. Uh, I was assigned to, uh, at that time, air police or security police, and their training center was at Lackland. So I didn't get leave. I went immediately from basic training right into uh, security police training and uh, police law enforcement training. And uh, graduated from there on Pearl Harbor Day. How about that? Yeah. And uh, then took 30-day leave and came home. Yeah. So, it's interesting, you said that you were pretty much a loner in high school, you didn't do the team sports and, no. you know, all that. How did that, how did that affect you when you're suddenly thrown into a group and you, you've got to work with other people now, you know, um, people you don't know, people you've never been around. Um, is, it, is it a little bit of a culture shock to you? Uh, yeah, but you get over that quick in basic right. training. Right. You, uh, that was one of the main things, you work as a team. Right. And uh, you learn as a team. Mm -hmm. uh, if somebody screws up, then you're all punished everybody, as a team. So everybody has to pay. Yeah. Everybody has to pay. Yeah. So you learn real quick that yeah. uh, your brotherhood yeah. starts there. Right. Now, were, was your training geared toward Vietnam? Um, no. As a matter of fact, uh, it was actually, uh, we were trained in security and we were trained in military law. So, uh, actually, when I went to McGuire, which was my first duty station, uh, I worked in law enforcement. 
As a matter of fact, the entire time I was at McGuire, uh, I worked in law enforcement as a law enforcement officer, uh, doing traffic patrol, accident investigations. And, so uh, like a military police Yeah, officer, the same as military in, in police, only in the Air Force is Air Police or Security uh -huh. Police. Right. And uh, that's, that's what we did. Uh, my job on uh, McGuire, uh, I ended up real lucky with that. There was another guy in my squadron that was the same build and same size as I was, and that's one of the pictures that we had. Uh, we worked main gate, so we were elite. Uh, and we ended up having to wear, of course, on the main gate at that period of time, and that's not done now. Uh, you wore class A uniform, and you were decked out. I mean, the white you hat. you were the the first one that right. anybody met coming into right. base. So you had to look sharp, and the two of us looked like identical twins, one working on one side and one working on the mm -hmm. other side. So we did that, and then if the general, who was the commander of the base, went to anything off the base, any type of function or parties or dances or whatever he went to, uh, we went with him because we were his honor guard mm -hmm. and we would drive a staff car up and stand at the front door and salute the general uh, when he went in and when he came out and other than that we were on our own time. Now was, um, was McGuire a secure post back then because I know in the late 60s and early 70s Fort, um, Fort Meade wasn't, it was kind of like an open post. Was McGuire pretty McGuire secure? was an open post. Uh, for most of the time I was there, uh, there was some problems with race rides at that time. And because of that, uh, there was times that we closed down because we'd have people attempt to get on mm -hmm. the base. And uh, uh, so they would tighten security. Mm -hmm. uh, I, can re I can remember one particular time uh, uh, we were told to check all IDs coming in on buses and uh, I ran up against a colonel who was in full uniform who decided he wasn't going to show me his ID mm -hmm. <clears throat> and I promptly took him off the bus which didn't make anybody very happy mm -hmm. but it happened and uh, as it was my commander backed me 100 percent. So what was the saying they used to say my authority outweighs your rank I think it yeah. was or something like that something that, that they well they we carried say. actually if you were on the base and you were working under the base commander, you carried the, the authority of the base commander. Yeah. So, and he was a general. Right, so. right. So yeah. you got your time in at, at McGuire, and yeah. then at some point in time, you got that um, those orders cut that said you were going to Vietnam, or yeah. did you go somewhere else before Actually, that? no. About two and a half years, I think, we spent at McGuire, and uh, finally got orders. My first orders were to go through combat AZR training at Camp mm -hmm. Bolas, Texas. Uh, Camp Ball is an army base, or army post, mm -hmm. and uh, that was my indication because uh, what they were doing was sending us through combat training to go overseas, and at, even at that time I still didn't know where in Vietnam I was going, but I knew I was going into a combat zone. So we took uh, several weeks of combat training and then went back to McGuire, and then from there uh, was supposed to go. Uh, to Saigon. Now is that at McGuire, is that where you met somebody special? Yeah, it is. As a matter of fact, uh, my wife and I are both Air Force uh -huh. veterans. Barbara was uh, a sergeant uh, and working at uh, base supply at McGuire uh -huh. and her barracks was across the street from the security police barracks. Okay. Uh, so we met in, in uh, McGuire, uh, dated for about a year. Did she outrank you by any chance? No. Oh, okay. <laughs> you got lucky there, huh? Well, not not really. Uh, uh, I I outranked Barbara uh, by a month. Oh, okay. Uh, we were both box sergeants. Okay. Uh, uh, like I said, she worked in base supply. Uh, approximately, and I'll say this real clear, approximately two months before I went to Vietnam, uh, I went over and I asked her commander for her hand in marriage uh -huh. because if she was in the military I had to have yeah. her commander's permission. Yeah. I guess you had to have yours too, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean correct. Yes. You had oh to yeah. Have, yeah. 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 It all yeah. had to be cleared. Right. So uh, uh, her commander said it was about time that I asked for mm -hmm. her hand and I went ahead and asked Barbara to marry me. 
And we were married exactly 40 days before I went to uh, Vietnam. Mm -hmm. I was allowed 30 days uh, leave and 10 days travel time to Travis Air Base. And uh, Barbie and I got married and we came to Salisbury and spent our honeymoon down mm -hmm. here with my family uh, on Church Street. Mm -hmm. And uh, then we packed up, she went back to the base and I called a flight to uh, Travis Air Base. Mm -hmm. And from there, flew to Japan, and from Japan into Saigon. Mm -hmm. So you ended up in Vietnam. What was your, I asked this question just about of everybody I interviewed that went there. What was your first impression? I've heard different, different thoughts, you know, the smell, <laughs> the heat, the... Uh, well, it was definitely was... that. Uh, the smell is, is well, it, almost mildew. It's it's uh -huh. jungle. Right. Uh, uh, I was, and uh, Tonsonu. Tonsonu was the international airport for Saigon. So I was on the outskirts of one of the biggest cities in South Vietnam. So, but there was still that that odor, and of course you had monsoon seasons and. Uh, the heat was unbearable. Uh, I was uh, coming out of actually Salisbury in September of that year, so it was fairly cool here. Mm -hmm. And when I touched down in Saigon, uh, the temperature was in excess of 100 degrees. Mm -hmm. And uh, your first thing that happens is you soak through your clothes. Uh, and it takes about two weeks to acclimate to that climate right. and, of course, that humidity. Yeah. The humidity is terrible. So uh, it takes a while to get used to it. Mm -hmm. So you get, you, you, you're on the ground in, in Vietnam and you get assigned to do what? My initial uh, assignment was U.S. Armed Forces Customs Liaison. Now, that's a big term for searching baggage at the International Airport, which is what we did during the daytime. Uh, if we were not in high security ratings, uh, and, and that's something too, is uh, we worked on two different things. Uh, it was an A and a number security levels. One was probability and the other one was whether it was really possible or not according to intelligence. So uh, as long as you were somewhere around a four or a five and it was a C or a D, then things were relatively quiet. So you could do what you wanted to uh, within the base. And of course, if you had an A1 rating, you were under attack. So uh, we went to a guard mount, which is a normal police function. Every time before you go on duty, they assign your post. And of course, they give all the intelligence reports at that time. Mm -hmm. So every time we went on duty, we had an intelligence report as to what the probability was of coming under attack. and. Uh, by that, uh, if we went under high ratings, we pulled our standard eight-hour duty, which was during the daytime for me uh, at, the, at the airport, and then you'd pull eight hours of standby. Uh, the reason for that, um, <clears throat> Tonsonude had a 25-mile perimeter. It was a huge base. Its average influx was almost a quarter of a million people a day. So there was a lot of checking and rechecking and a lot of security that went on in the base, not only on the perimeters, but at the front gate and any other access mm -hmm. gate to the, to the base. Uh, when you got into your uh, evening, if you went under high security, then uh, you pulled what they called quick reaction teams. And the quick reaction teams uh, were dispersed all over the base. Uh, my, my police squadron was 1,600 men, <clears throat> and that sounds like a huge squadron it was, but you think about that and then think about a 25-mile perimeter mm -hmm. that has to be guarded 24 hours a day. So uh, we weren't really staffed uh, as a combat unit like Army or Marine Corps, mm -hmm. and uh, because they didn't want us all in one place at one time, uh, they would break us up into what they called quick reaction teams and we would be sent to different parts of the perimeter on standby during the evening hours. That way if we came under attack, there wasn't a large group anywhere that could be hit. And uh, that was uh, 
part of my exposure to Agent Orange because we'd be a black on the perimeter, which had been cleared by Agent Orange. <coughs> so you would do that. Uh, I got to a point uh, where my duty changed and I started pulling night duty at uh, the air terminal. And that was much more preferred as far as I was concerned because most of the attacks that you came under were at night. If we come under a racket or a mortar attack or even a ground assault, it was done at night. Uh, during broad daylight, it was just uh, too hazardous for anybody to attack a base. Mm -hmm. So all that was at night. So if I was on duty at night, it meant I had my flag vest, my helmet, and I was fully armed and prepared to defend myself in the base mm -hmm. where if I'd been off duty, I would have been running in my skivvies to take shelter from right. my barracks, yeah. so, which happened occasionally. Mm -hmm. uh, there was times uh, that uh, actually we got so tired uh, of getting hit all the time. Before Tet Offensive, uh, the North Vietnamese tried to do uh, a demoralization type tactic. Uh, they would fire rockets and mortars into the base at 2 o'clock and at 4 o'clock a.m. So they keep you up all night. They did that for 23 days before Tet Offensive. Well, about 10 or 15 days into it, the guys got tired of getting up. So most of them would put their headset on, turn their recorders on, and they'd go to sleep and say, to heck with it. Uh, if they hit me, they hit me. Uh, and a lot of them wouldn't get up and go take shelter. It was something that they should have done, but didn't. Uh, for me, during that particular period of time, I was already on duty. So uh, that was beneficial to mm -hmm. me because I didn't have to take shelter. I was already probably somewhere where I could very easily uh, hunker down. Right. Uh, you mentioned you mentioned digging the hole and standing on the boards yeah. so you'd have something to jump in. Explain how that worked. We worked entry controls into different sections of the base. And of course, if you went into that area, you had to have identification that got you mm -hmm. into that area. Uh, so as an entry controller, we usually had a little shack, which is probably four feet square, with a roof on it and open sides. and. Uh, we stood in, inside of that and uh, we checked IDs coming and going all the time. And uh, because of the, uh, the fact that we could come under attack and we didn't have any place else to take shelter, uh, most of the time we'd dig a foxhole right in the middle of the guard shack, about three feet deep. And when we stood guard, we stood on the two befores on the side of the guard shack and the minute we came under attack where the base sirens went off, you could drop. Mm -hmm. And uh, as a matter of fact, that's where that one war trophy that mm -hmm. I've got, uh, I can show that to you now or... Yeah, what have you got? Yeah, well, let me show you that. Uh, I've actually got several items here, but that one, uh, when I came up out of the hole that time, uh, there was a rocket went off close. Mm -hmm. And actually, uh, that's a piece of a Chai Com rocket. Uh, which I spent most of the evening digging out of the top of my guard shack with my bayonet. Uh, war trophy. Yeah. So uh, I'm lucky it missed me. That's pretty yeah. good. So, so you would stay in that guard shack for your eight hour shift or yeah. ten hour shift, and, yeah. and then in the daytime you get to sleep. Hopefully. Hopefully. Yeah. Yeah. Hopefully. Uh, you, you mentioned Tet. How 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 much ahead of Tet did you get to Vietnam? How long were you in Vietnam before the I went into tet? Vietnam in September, and Tet came along a little bit after Christmas. Okay. So right. There was a period of time uh, when I first arrived uh, at Tan Sanut that I could actually go downtown mm -hmm. uh, into Saigon. And uh, as a matter of fact, uh, there was a, a South Vietnamese regular sergeant that I worked with regularly. and. Uh, uh, on weekends, uh, if I could get a base pass, I could go downtown, and we would go downtown and, and eat dinner at one of the restaurants. Right. So I got to know some of the local food. Mm -hmm. uh, one in particular we went to was a barge, which was right on the Mekon Delta in downtown Saigon, and uh, it was called the Mekon, and 
I guess during the period of time I was there, I think they sunk it probably four times <laughs> with uh, charges on the side of the right, barge. Yeah. They'd clean it up and make it fluid again yeah. and open the restaurant right back up again. Right so, yeah. But uh, I got to see a lot of Saigon uh, that most people don't get to see. I, I, I visited some of the Buddhist temples, uh, their zoos. Uh, mm -hmm. Beautiful tropical gardens with goldfish that were probably that big, uh, and I, I, you know, I got a lot of slides and pictures of mm -hmm. that uh, until things got worse around Christmas and slightly after Christmas we started hitting uh, priority B two or priority mm -hmm. A, and it was three or four, and the probabilities got so high that they finally closed the base. Nobody was allowed to yeah. go off the base. So I suppose when Tet started, the base got a lot busier as far as influx of airplane, air, aircraft coming in and going out and equipment coming in. Is that correct? Well, you had that, uh, plus the, the fact that uh, our air base, actually our, uh, our protection was, was the cavalry, uh, which was Army. and. Uh, during Tet Offensive, we were supposed to have an influx uh, from the cavalry uh, to help support our defense of the base. Uh, that didn't happen because the North Vietnamese cut them off on the other side of Saigon. So that left the 1,600-man squadron to defend the base, and the largest weapon we had was an M60. We didn't have tanks or mm -hmm. mortars or anything other than mm -hmm. Our quick reaction team was 13 men with, with uh, M16s. Uh, they had two grenade launchers and a machine gunner. That's mm -hmm. what a quick reaction team was. And that's what we defended the base with. We did that for 72 hours before we finally uh, got the cavalry coming through the front gates, before they finally penetrated through Saigon and got into the base to help us. And by that time, uh, we were already in a cleanup mode uh, because the vast majority of those who were attacking us were already uh, taken care of. And by that, I mean most of the people that attacked, uh, what we had attacked was 3,000 uh, North Vietnamese regulars. Probably 85 or 95 percent of them died before they hit the perimeter. Uh, they did that because we had tremendous air support from Benoit Air Base. And uh, that was the little thing I think I mentioned to you was uh, uh, Puff the Magic Dragon. Right. Uh, that's what we had with the Dragon ships come in. Now, they fired many guns, and as a matter of fact, I've got beautiful slides of them. Uh, you can see the jagged bolt of lightning coming out of the sky, except it wasn't lightning, it was tracer bullets. Mm -hmm. but. Uh, one of the uh, magic dragons, if he made a pass over an area, could put a bullet in every square foot of a football field. So there was no getting away. Mm -hmm. If he hit a target right on, um, there was an awful lot of right. lead coming down. Right. And of course, uh, every third or fourth bullet's a tracer. And that's what gave it the name of magic dragon. One was this huge cloud of smoke from firing a minigun, mm -hmm. two, was this razor sharp jagged edge coming from the sky down to the ground. And uh, what those planes would do is fly a, a circle and the pilot would drop his wingtip and actually he sighted from the pilot's cabin to the wingtip to the point on the ground. That's how he sighted those mini guns. And they were cargo planes that they'd converted? They were cargo from, planes they that they'd opened the cargo bays on and mounted these mini guns in. Uh -huh. And there was two or three guys in the back that were strapped in so they couldn't fall out the door. And they did nothing but just feed them. Mm -hmm. uh, belts and belts and belts of ammunition. So it's like an electronic Gatlin gun. Mm -hmm. uh, so they could fire electronically right. just like uh, the ignition on the car. So they put out a lot of ammunition very quick. Yeah. So I suppose, I suppose this base was fenced, of course. Yeah. And you had a clear, cleared area, so many hundreds of feet or yeah. so many feet around it. So anybody trying, any insurgents trying to get in, yeah. you know, would be spotted or there was, yeah. you know, some and kind of way was, you would know. That was what those quick reaction teams were for. Um, 
I worked on a quick reaction team on one particular night under a very high priority. And of course, you were on standby, so you weren't guarding the perimeter, you were just dispersed. So you could lay down, take a nap, or mm -hmm. sleep, or whatever you wanted. You were on your, your eight hours of standby. So normally we'd throw a poncho down on the ground and, <clears throat> and take a nap or mm -hmm. whatever. Uh, on one particular evening that we did that, we actually came under attack. Uh, I was laying on my back on the ground with an M16 across my chest, and I had a hand grenade on each side of my flak vest. And the first rocket that hit the ground lifted me about eight, maybe nine feet off the ground. I went right straight up, hmm. and so did the ground. Yeah. Uh, it was far enough away that I didn't catch anything off of it, but that's how big the, the explosion the was. Impact, yeah. And I can remember coming down and grabbing the hand grenades, and the rifle hit me in the chest. <laughs> but uh, you wanted to make sure that I wanted to make sure the pins were yeah, <laughs> still in there. Yeah. But yeah. Uh, that was one occasion that you know had a good close call on that one. Mm -hmm. So yeah. uh, I had a number of close calls, and mm -hmm. uh, I guess uh, good Lord was with me, so I'm still here. Yeah. So the Tet, the Tet, how long did that go on? Was Actually, the attack on our base was like 72 hours. At the end of that, uh, what we were in charge of is those quick reaction teams would mop up areas. In other words, we'd get a report that uh, uh, what they called a zapper squad or two or three North Vietnamese had actually penetrated. Mm -hmm. And they try their hardest at that time. The, their target first was the runway, and the second one was the Tamaracks where our all your uh, or taxis were all your planes, mm -hmm. so they could run down a line of planes and throw explosive mm -hmm. charges underneath of them and wreak havoc. So we had to mop that up. So uh, we actually picked up on that and uh, were responsible for cleaning the area up mm -hmm. after it was all over. Stepping back a little bit, I, I suppose the base had a lot of civilian employees. Most definitely. And so they had to be screened really carefully and whenever they came in. Or <laughs> Well, it's supposed to be. Anyway. It's funny you should ask that. Uh, right after Tet Offensive, uh, most of the general staff cars didn't have drivers. Let's see. Hmm. Uh, so they so were they, Vietnamese civilians. Yeah. And uh, as a matter of fact, uh, we couldn't find barbers for about a month and a half, two months, because they were, they were also the barbers. Yeah. So they came in. We had North Vietnamese working inside the post. Right. Yeah. All the time, right. and of course that was one of the main sources they had was to be a driver for staff. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, we lost a lot of uh, overhead help right after right. Right. Uh, Tet Offensive, Sorry. and it wasn't an, it wasn't uncommon. Uh, I had uh, uh, we had Mamasans come through the base that worked in the barracks. Uh, they did the house cleaning and they laundered mm -hmm. and did everything like that. It wasn't uncommon for them to leave a satchel charge at the main gate uh, or try to bring some explosive device mm -hmm. into, the, hmm. into the building. Uh, so you're always uh, a little leery and a little weary of uh, who you're around. And uh, to this day, uh, if I go to a restaurant, I sit uh, facing the door. Uh, to this day, I still, I'm up a lot of times at two and at four. Uh, I've gotten to a point where I miss two every now and then, but I'm still up at four, mm -hmm. which that was conditioned into me right. because of all the repeated rocket and mortar attacks mm -hmm. that I had. And this is, uh, what, 55 years now. Right, right. So it's stuck. Never leaves you. Never leaves you. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, you know, uh, that type of thing is always with you. When we worked uh, in the terminal, uh, checking bags, uh, you were constantly weary of checking a bag and finding that some soldier had put his razor in the bottom and you cut your fingertips. Uh, I witnessed a young man uh, one evening coming in to catch a freedom flight home and catch that freedom flight home carrying this duffel bag uh, he was dragging across the floor because it was too heavy, uh, which immediately 
raises questions. Yeah. Have it loaded with grenades, did he? Or? <laughs> it had a mortar around oh. in it. <laughs> and that was a of course, I had to promptly turn around to one of my associates and have them have EOD meet me in the parking lot yeah. uh, so they could dispose of that. But uh, all hand grenades were, yeah. were also. You could take war trophies home. Matter of fact, I've got one. I got a couple. Yeah, let me see that flag. <laughs> uh, now this is a North Vietnamese flag? That's the North Vietnamese flag. That's a VC flag that was uh -huh. captured somewhere up around the DMZ. Mm -hmm. and, uh, little, he, little war worn, isn't it? Yeah, a little bit. Yeah, yeah. It's a captured flag. Uh -huh. uh, this paymaster actually went out in the field and he paid the troops in cash. So he was looking for something to carry money in mm -hmm. and his receipts. I, uh, I, when I went over, I uh, carried my duffel bag and I carried a leather satchel with me, almost like a doctor's satchel that you open the top mm -hmm. and it contained quite a bit of space in it. So I went uh, on duty one night, I took it with me and he came through as he got off duty and I gave him the satchel. I said, here, take this and it'll give you something to carry the money and the change in when you go out in the field to pay these troops. So. Well, he's very thankful, very appreciative, and about two weeks later, he showed up with that flag, that. Yeah. and he said, uh, "My unit captured this, yeah. and I wanted you to have about it." That. Yeah. So I was I was really overwhelmed at the idea. Yeah. So. So, you got through your duty there. Yeah. What happened next? Well, we came home. Yeah. Um, we came home to a country that was in an uproar because uh, of Vietnam. And- uh, Wasn't any parades for you? There was no, no, no temper, temperament had changed. And uh, when I flew into Travis, and I was warned, but I, uh, when I flew into Travis, uh, I had an officer come in and greet the troops coming off of the plane. We were in class A uniforms. And, uh, at that time, it's probably a, a summer uniform, 1505. Uh, we were in uniform, and uh, an officer came in and he says, The first thing you guys do is change into civilian clothes. <clears throat> uh, why? He says, Because the temperament in this country right now is pretty bad, and we don't want anybody taking any. Right anything out on, on your military. Well, you know, it's kind of silly. You dress in civilian clothes. I'm coming back from a tropical zone. <clears throat> I- uh, Got a crew cut. <laughs> I've got a crew cut and a suntan, right. which, which uh, has to be Southeast Asian yeah. because I'm, I'm, I'm fairly dark and I mm. am dark complected. Mm. So that was the first hint that uh, yeah. we got that something was was definitely wrong in this country. Uh, Did you stay in the military long after you came back? I was in the military about seven months. As a matter okay. of fact, uh, uh, while I was in Vietnam, Barbara got orders. And her orders were for Caramacel, Turkey, which was an 18-month secluded assignment, meaning I couldn't go with her. Uh, a, I'd just been married 13 months and hadn't seen a bride. So for me to see her leave for another 18 months as a newlywed was almost unbearable. And my communication with her just before I came back from Vietnam was refuse the orders. That's a court martial offense. Uh -huh. She avoided signing the orders until I actually got back to McGuire. At that time, uh, we went to personnel and uh, talked uh, to a full bird colonel and personnel and explained their situation to him. And he says, uh, as long as she has time to serve, she has to go. But I can tell you a way. And I said, all right, what's that? He says, you separate in seven months. He says, if she files a hardship to separate with you because of her marital status, we'll drop the orders. So Barbara served a little over three years of her four-year service mm -hmm. uh, to separate with me. Now, the reason for that was quite simple. 
I was offered uh, quite a bonus and uh, a choice of assignments if I re-upped. And uh, uh, I would have made a, a new grade. I would have gone E5 or E6. <clears throat> and I was promised a, a four-year tour or a three-year tour in Germany. And she could go with me if she re-upped too. Uh, that looked really nice, except Vietnam was still hot, and I was fully trained, combat experienced, and if I went to Germany, I would not be there more than a month before I would get a TDY assignment right straight back to Vietnam, mm -hmm. because they were people were in demand, especially those with training and the combat experience. Right. So for that reason. Uh, we separated. Mm -hmm. Came back. Now, when to you Salisbury. say separated, you separated from the service. <coughs> separated okay. from the service. Okay. Let's right. get that straight. Yeah. Okay. Barbie and I have been married fifty-four years. Right. Right. Okay. So, yeah, we're doing good. Yeah. Good. 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 <laughs> good. 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 But uh, that was one of the reasons uh, why we separated from the Air Force. Uh, it didn't please Barbara because Barbara would have stayed on until she retired. Uh, she loved the Air Force, and uh, the Air Force treated her right. Mm -hmm. uh, Barbara come from West Virginia and uh, she wanted to see the world and learn about different things mm -hmm. and unfortunately she got stationed at McGuire and never got to move anywhere mm -hmm. else and when she finally got orders she couldn't take them. Right. So uh, it, didn't, mm -hmm. it didn't make her feel happy. Right. It made her happy that we were both together mm -hmm. and that we, we'd made it. Uh, we went through quite a bit of acclimation when we got back to this country and when we finally got settled. Uh, Barbie and I moved to Salisbury. Uh, I applied for jobs all over the place and couldn't get one uh, because if I had mentioned Vietnam veteran, it was, thank you, sir, we'll call you. Uh, that was the attitude. I finally did get a job in Salisbury. My first job here in Salisbury was with a men's clothier, and you may remember it. I don't know some of the newcomers will, was with Ralph and Gaskell. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, I worked out in what was then the new mall, right. which is non existent now, and uh, sold clothes. Ralph and Gaskell was a premier, uh, premier clothing store in Salisbury. It Salisburg was indeed. Time. That's, it uh, was indeed. As a matter yeah. of fact, I learned a horrendous amount about clothing and yeah. still use that knowledge to this right, day. Right. Uh, Barbara worked at Sears and Roebuck, mm -hmm. and uh, from there we kept going. Uh, but uh, along the way, it, we had our, our rough times. I have PTSD, so uh, I, I had to battle some nightmares and stuff. Mm -hmm. And of course, Barbara was involved in all of that. Yeah. Uh, actually, the first time uh, we got an introduction to that, uh, when I came back to McGuire, Barbara had already found a place for us to live as a husband and wife in a little trailer park uh, out off of Fort Dix in uh, Cookstown, I believe, a uh, little trailer park. Uh, she went out there on weekends before I actually came back and set the trailer up, house cleaned it, and got it all ready for us to occupy. and. Uh, when we finally did come back and move into the trailer and I had my assignment duty and she had hers at McGuire, uh, I guess about the first or second night that we spent in the trailer, uh, I came out of the bed at about 2 a.m. in the morning trying to get underneath of it with her grabbing at my t-shirt yelling, what's mm -hmm. wrong? Mm -hmm. uh, and I had to stop once I woke up and look at her and say, do you hear that? Hear what? I said, just listen. Do you hear that? And you could hear it off in the distance. Thump. Fort Dix was firing mortars. I see. Doing on their mortar range. Yeah, yeah. My ears picked it up. Yeah. Uh, that happened on a number of occasions through, throughout our first years together. Mm -hmm. uh, I had uh, a Fourth of July event and Barbie and I stopped at uh, Dunkin' Donut and uh, we we're going to get a coffee and some donuts. And at that time, the Dunkin' Donut was not where it is now. It was more closer to the railroad tracks. And um, 
had a kid set off a bottle rocket at uh, the railroad tracks, and I dropped the coffee and donuts and went under the truck. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, yeah. it, it stays with you. Yeah. Yeah. It really does. Yeah. So you, you got home, you got back to Salisbury. Your father was had a business, what was it, a uh, sign business or something? Daddy, Daddy owned Casper Sign Casper Studio sign, on Church that. Street, yeah. and uh, he painted signs there yeah. close to 50 years. Yeah, did you join him at some point in time? Or? Actually, as a teenager, uh, I used to block out billboards and signs. As a matter of fact, uh, uh, we had a, a billboard uh, over by what used to be Gosley Roofing on US 13 North. And uh, I had a ladder slip out from under me bl blocking a billboard out and ended up hanging off of one of the light fixtures mm -hmm. until my father could get down and put the ladder back up mm -hmm. for me. But yeah, I used to work with him a lot uh, doing billboards and blocking out signs. He'd do the lettering yeah, uh, and uh, I, would, I would do the mm -hmm. sanding and the blocking out and treating of the materials before he did the sign. So eventually you got in business for yourself and you've joined several or you've been involved in several veterans organizations. Yeah, I'm right now I'm a life member of the American Legion, the VFW, the Vietnam Veterans Association and the DAV, mm -hmm. since I'm a disabled American veteran. Mm -hmm. And I've worked various positions with all of them over the last uh, probably 15 to 20 years. Mm -hmm. uh, the most active thing I'm doing now is uh, I'm a, a vice commander at post uh, 194 VFW here in Salisbury across from the new post office. And I am a district vice commander in the American Legion. Uh, the district is above. So uh, as a district vice commander, uh, there are 16 posts on the Eastern Shore that I look over and right. I visit. Uh, Barbara is also uh, a vice district commander, uh, and she is also a state officer, state executive officer with the State American mm -hmm. Legion. So she's very active in the American Legion. I'm very active in VFW, and then we're both very active together. Mm -hmm. But we do a lot of things for veterans. Uh, there's not a day at our place of business that uh, Barbara doesn't sit down with a veteran and literally listen to them. And this is probably one of the biggest things uh, that you can do with a veteran is if they got a problem, listen to them. Uh, it gives them a place to vent. It gives them a place to lower their anxiety. And she's very good at it. Uh, because of the fact that we've worked with veterans over so many years, mm -hmm. uh, we know a lot of contacts. So the veterans know or actually now are referred to us uh, so that we can help them in the local area find what they need, food, clothing, uh, mm -hmm. and help. Uh, and over the years, uh, Barbara and I have actually opened two nonprofits up. Uh, the original one is about 15, 16 years old, and it's called uh, Concerned Parents for Kids Corporation. Um, we got tired of seeing kids get off the school bus in the winter time with a t-shirt on. Uh, so we started a clothing and a food ministry and that's mm -hmm. what Concerned Parents is. And uh, we provide clothing to most of the schools in this county mm -hmm. or upon request for burnouts or something else right. that happens. Uh, the other nonprofit that we opened up was about six years ago. Uh, we had a dentist come to us and uh, he says, hey, uh, I've got some time that I will donate if you've got a veteran that needs teeth worked on. Well, the VA doesn't work on teeth. You have to be 100% disabled in order to get dental assistance through the VA. So we started a grassroots program you know, about five or six years ago called Veteran Smile Makeover. And they're both nonprofits both 501c3s. And its primary function was to find dentist who would do some volunteer work and the actual organization would put up a thousand dollars a patient towards that dentist's expenses. In hmm. other words, whatever he had to buy to do the job right, with. Right. He volunteered his time. Uh, 
we've not really had a dentist in the last six years bill us for the time or the materials. How about that? Yeah. Uh, We've got a dentist here in Salisbury, and I'm not going to tell you his name, but anyway, we have a dentist here in Salisbury. He sent me an invoice one year. He had done $26,000 in donations to our Veteran Smile organization, just time and materials. Right. Uh, we work with veterans who are in desperate need. Uh, we don't do fillings. Uh, we're not going to do cleanings. Mm -hmm. Uh, we're working with veterans that have got maybe two or three teeth left in their head <clears throat> and probably some pretty good infection and they need those teeth pulled. This dentist that we have, there's different ones because we've had more than one, uh, will extract all those teeth and then over the process of about six months it takes to do the healing and then to do the impressions and then to do fittings, and then to actually put false teeth in. We have a gentleman here in Salisbury that does those dentures for us. Uh, he do, he's done them free of charge. His father was in the military, so he, he has mm -hmm. a great deal of respect for veterans. And uh, he does the teeth for us. And we've got a lot of happy people right now that Good. have gone through a, probably about 75 or 80 in the last five or six years. That's great. Uh, they've taken their teeth out and yeah. given them new teeth and a good smile and about half of them have become gamefully employed again. Yeah. Uh, gives it, them that confidence. That it gives them the confidence. Yeah. Uh, our poster child was, was uh, a cook and uh, he wasn't probably uh, six months going back to work uh, because he could look at people and talk to people mm -hmm. and, and he didn't have an ugly mouth. And, right, right. Of course, in the food service business, mm -hmm. you had to look good. So yeah. uh, it's been a very, very uh, moving right. program that we've worked with. But we are, we're deeply involved in helping veterans. Mm -hmm. Oh, good. It's, it's great when you can come home and carry that on to help people you know, that's been through, it is. been it through is. the problems and, yeah. you know. So. And you know, it, it, like at one time uh, with the clothing ministry, uh, we used to put clothes out in front of the store on racks. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've had people come in to the store and say, remember me? And I said, no. He says, uh, well, I, I was looking to get a, a job and I had to go for an interview and I didn't have any clothes to wear. And he says, and you give me the clothes and I got the job. Cool. That's good. And they come in and, and show their appreciation yeah. Yeah. for what we've done for them. And it, it, it's very moving. And most of those people end up giving back at some point in time. Yes, indeed. Yeah, yeah, yeah they do. Yeah, they'll see, see because that. somebody did it for them. Yeah. Barbara yeah. had a kid come back in, uh, oh, about a week ago. And he says, uh, he says, I wanted to stop back by and, and see you. And, uh, Barbara says, uh, all right, I know the face, but I can't remember the name. And he, he told her what his name was. He says, I came to you, and he says, I was hungry. And he says, you took me back here and fed me. And this was when he was 10, 12, 15 mm -hmm. years old. And he says, uh, I was sleeping on the floor at my mom and dad's apartment. And he says, you guys went and got a mattress and gave it to me to go home so I could sleep on. He says, and I just wanted to stop back by here and see you. And he's fairly prominent now. Got a good job, good. Uh, yeah. family, and getting ready to have a little one. Oh, good. good. So it, it works. Yeah. Well, Dave, look, I want to thank you for coming in. I enjoyed this talk. Is there anything else we didn't talk about you'd like to mention? No, I think we've covered it all. Yeah, yeah. Um, I want to thank you for your service, yeah, personally, and and tell your wife thank her. I will. Yeah, yeah. I, I thank Barb for sticking with me. God, yeah, yeah. Because I, I I have times when I'm pretty hard to get along with. That's because we're old guys, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> thank you for watching Eastern Shore Veterans, their story, their honor. If you see a veteran out there, tell them thank you. And if any veterans want to do an interview. Be sure and give us a call here at Pack 14. Thank you.